Good afternoon. My name is Miles Sheehan, and I'm the director of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. And I'm happy to welcome you to this year's Pellegrino Symposium. Although, unfortunately, we can't be together in person, we wanted to reach out and provide a program that would let you know about some exciting developments here at the Pellegrino Center and at Georgetown University, as well as look at some of the critical issues that face us in bioethics. I have one correction for today's program. Dr. Michelle Rowett, who was scheduled to be our second speaker, had a sudden and unavoidable conflict and will not be with us. We look forward to welcoming Dr. Rowett on another occasion. But I am happy to announce that Dr. Susan Chang of Georgetown University will be speaking in her place and I'll introduce her before she makes her remarks. In a moment, you'll see two pre-recorded conversations. The first is from Dr. Jack DeJoya, the president of Georgetown University who will welcome you to this year's symposium. I'm very grateful to Dr. DeJoya for taking the time for this recording. This is Georgetown's graduation weekend. So he needed to record this beforehand. Immediately following Dr. DeJoya's comments, Dr. Kevin Donovan will give a presentation focusing on the past 10 years in bioethics. In that discussion, he'll talk about what's gone on at the Pellegrino Center during his tenure as the director of this center, as well as some of the leading issues that occurred in bioethics during that time. Dr. Donovan, as you know, led the Pellegrino Center from 2012 until this past fall, trained in pediatrics and pediatric gastroenterology, Dr. Donovan first came to Georgetown in 1989 as a visiting scholar, where he worked with Dr. Pellegrino. Returning to his home state of Oklahoma, he continued his clinical practice, obtained a master's degree in bioethics from the University of Oklahoma, and was the founding member of the Oklahoma Bioethics Center, founding director, I should have said. In 2012, with the endorsement of Dr. Pellegrino, Dr. Donovan came back to Georgetown to be the director of the Pellegrino Center. And today, Dr. Donovan will share with all of us some of the major events over the last 10 years in his tenure and in bioethics. So now let's begin with some words from Georgetown's president, Dr. John DeJoya. It's a privilege to welcome all of you to our Pellegrino Symposium. And I wish to thank Father Sheehan for his leadership and for gathering us together to reflect on this moment in bioethics with such a wonderful group of colleagues. I'd like to especially recognize Dr. Kevin Donovan, the former director of our Center for Clinical Bioethics. Dr. Michelle Rowett, professor and chair of our Department of Family Medicine. Father Gael Giraud, the inaugural director of our environmental justice program and the director of our Kennedy Institute, Dr. Dan Solmazy. I'd also like to thank our Pellegrino student scholar, Parham Tofiji, for making this special occasion that much more special. In just a few days, we'll celebrate this year's commencement of the class of 2021 at a time in which the significance of bioethics, this intersection of health, medicine, and ethics, has never been more present to us. Yet for almost 50 years at Georgetown, we have had the benefit of being the home of the most exciting and transformative work in bioethics through the pioneering contributions of Dr. Ed Pellegrino. 42 years ago at the commencement of the class of 1979, Dr. Pellegrino was recognized with an honorary degree. Even then, the lasting impact of Ed's leadership was clear. In the years since, Ed shared his wisdom and insights with so many students and colleagues, building the field of bioethics and creating the academic homes where the study of bioethics could continue to flourish. 
in his 2005 address to our white coat ceremony for our medical students. Dr. Pellegrino described the importance of sustaining the elements of trust and ethics within the changing landscape of medicine. I quote him here, remember always that you have and will have enormous power to help and to harm. And today, as we gain increasing power over every facet of human life through advance and progress in contemporary biology, it becomes clearer and clearer that if we are to use that power wisely and well, it must be used within ethical constraints." Close quote. Those who had the pleasure of knowing Ed and his work knew that among the fundamental questions he pursued was trust, building and sustaining trust and professional ethics as a foundation for the medical profession. This year's symposium is an invitation to pursue these same ideas, to illuminate the most important questions of ethics in our current context, how the questions of bioethics come alive in this moment. Our Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics and our Kennedy Institute of Ethics have carried forth Dr. Pellegrino's work and new scholars and leaders have advanced our engagement with ethics across many disciplines. We have the opportunity now to deepen this sense of collaboration and multidisciplinary engagement with ethics with the creation of a new emergent ethics network here at Georgetown. This new network will provide the foundation for campus-wide collaboration on emerging ethical questions led by our Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics, our Kennedy Institute of Ethics, our new Georgetown Environmental Justice Program, and with a new focus on data science. I can imagine no better time and no better place to imagine the future of bioethics. And I wish to thank everyone again for joining us for this year's symposium. Thank you for your presence and your participation, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you for having me today. Happy to meet with you, if only virtually. May you live in interesting times. This statement said to be a Chinese curse could certainly be applied to the last decade in bioethics, the topic that I have been assigned to review. It's a bit daunting, but I will try to do so while connecting it to the responsive activities of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. The timing is somewhat propitious in that this coincides almost exactly with my tenure as director of the PCCB. I'm usually expected to give an accounting of our progress and activity to the executive dean of the medical school. Today, I will offer it to you instead as a sort of swan song, a personal perspective of important bioethical issues in the recent past seen through the lens of the Pellegrino Center. Can I say it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It absolutely was the best of times for me when I arrived. I was able to join the founding director of the center, Dr. Pellegrino, as well as a rich bequest of personnel from my predecessor. I got, as faculty and staff, John Collins Harvey, David Miller, Marty Patchell, and Kevin Fitzgerald, old friends from my previous foray at Georgetown in 1989-90. to it was then that I also first encountered the multi-talented Jim Giordano, as well as doctors Siva Subramanian and Sarah Batone, who rounded out the ethics consultation service. My first task on arrival coincided with my first love, teaching. I reviewed our educational programs and plan for bioethics education in the medical center with David Miller, and we made some revisions. 
These were revised the next year as our allotted time was changed and reduced. And again, the following year, until it appeared that our annual task would be to revise the revisions. As you know, this culminated in an entire curriculum revision for all the medical school. With great effort from David Miller, we kept our approach of lectures paired with small group discussions, but only with the help of about 20 indispensable volunteer faculty. With the new curriculum, everything had to be reimagined and repackaged into a much constricted time frame. I saw that it would be advantageous to expand formal ethics education into the clinical years as well. With the support of the departments of surgery, medicine, pediatrics, family medicine, OBGYN, neurology and psychiatry, I initiated recurring clinical ethics sessions in each of these departments during each of their educational blocks for third year medical students throughout the year. I was joined by faculty from each of these departments and we kept the discussions pertinent to the issues within that clinical department. It has required hours and hours of meeting with students in small groups during the clinical years, but I think of it as well worth it for the students. It has given me a great sense of accomplishment as well. In addition, we have a month long elective for students in their last year of medical school, as well as recurring programs for residents and fellows. So after taking stock, our first new job moving forward also involved a look back. Relying on the organizational skills of Marty Patchell, we developed the Pellegrino Symposium of 2013, the first occasion of what has now become an annual event, even up to today's effort. At the first one, we were blessed with the opportunity of reviewing and discussing the thoughts of Edmund Pellegrino with him in the company of his friends, former students, and colleagues. He was delighted by that, as well as the portrait, which was produced for the occasion and is now hanging in the Med Dent building. What he didn't expect was that I had secured approval to rename the center after him. He was surprised and deeply touched, and I was so happy that we could do that while he was still with us. It was about this time, shortly after losing Pellegrino, that I began to recruit and assemble the small group of additional full-time faculty that would respond to the ethical challenges and crises that we are about to consider and review today. If no one individual could replicate Pellegrino, perhaps the proper assortment could do a suitable job. I was already graced with Kevin Fitzgerald and Jim Giordano when I arrived, and Jim developed our program in neuroethics. My very first hire consisted of bringing Dan Macy back to Georgetown. With an initiative that met with such universal enthusiasm, this should have been easy to arrange. But with typical Georgetown efficiency, it took nearly two years of dogged and prolonged persistence to bring it to fruition. As you know, Dan is now on permanent loan to the Kennedy Institute of Ethics as the new director of our sister institution. This was followed by the acquisition of Dr. Claudia Sotomayor, who has already made great strides in strengthening the ethics consultation service at the hospital, working closely with Dr. Alan Roberts from the MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, whom we were able to add to our team part-time. Finally, I had the incredible good fortune to attract Miles Sheehan, Jesuit, physician, ethicist, and educator. I had the rare opportunity, such as Pellegrino had, to play a key role in selecting my successor. Although I might question Pellegrino's choice, I have no doubts that Miles Sheehan will strengthen the Pellegrino Center and bring it to even greater prominence. With this stellar constellation in place, we were prepared to face those issues in bioethics that confronted us all in the past decade. First on the list, chronologically, and high on the list in importance, was the world's response 
to a serious infectious challenge. No, I'm not talking about COVID yet. The world was first blindsided, then panicked by an epidemic out of Africa. Ebola was highly contagious, remarkably lethal and frightening. We again learned that in the modern world, we were no longer easily isolated one from the other. When sporadic cases appeared or were transferred into other countries, it became apparent that if the virtue of charity did not prompt us to offer help, prudential self-interest should. The same impulses of charity and self-interest came into conflict as each medical center made plans to respond to potential victims of this deadly virus. Who would treat them? Which healthcare professionals should be exposed? How much treatment was enough? And how much was too much? How much risk must a doctor or nurse assume as a matter of professional obligation? And when did it amount to subrogatory virtue? The international Ebola crisis went away, but these questions did not. Along with the flow and ebb of Ebola, there was the constant drumbeat of those developing ethical issues demanding our attention and our efforts. Some of them now feel like perennials, and some are the result of dramatic new developments. Which ones stick out in your mind? Which do you think are the most dramatic, the most troubling, the most unique? I asked this question of our PCCB faculty and asked them how they had responded. Their replies have been incorporated into the rest of this presentation. Here is what I heard in no particular order. Assisted suicide and euthanasia demanded the attention of ethicists, legislators, religious figures, figures and the general public. <clears throat> Laws permitting it were proposed and passed in seven more states, as well as the District of Columbia, and rejected in over 17. This was reflected as well in countries from Canada to Colombia, Spain to Switzerland. This occurred with much discussion and testimony, publications and presentations. I myself testified before state legislators, the DC Council, congressional aides, and the American Nursing Association, local medical societies, and the AMA, as well as having published papers setting out the arguments. These efforts were shared by Alan Roberts and by Dan Salmacy at a local and national level who was also published repeatedly on the subject. Of great concern was the expansion of eligibility for assisted suicide and euthanasia with proposals and actual practices put into effect for non-terminal, psychologically disturbed and pediatric patients. If assisted suicide or euthanasia were to be considered a medical benefit for some patients, it became more difficult to justify restrictions for others. The question of when is a person dead continued to trouble medical professionals, philosophers, and the general public. Widely publicized cases, such as that of Jehai McMath, and publications like the Presidential Council's white paper on the subject, served more to rile than to resolve the issue. The procedural details of a brain death diagnosis or its alternative death by circulatory criteria continued to be debated as necessary preconditions for organ transplantation. There were those who would even challenge this requirement and the dead donor rule. Even more striking was the link suggested between voluntary euthanasia and organ donation even to the point of advocating organ donation from a living participant as the path to their voluntary euthanasia. And speaking of transplantation ethics, it should be noted that transplantation of non-life sustaining organs also proceeded during this time frame to include not only face transplants and hand transplants, 
but also uterine and penile transplantation. The challenges presented by the field of genetics have been a constant during this decade, before then, and certainly on into the future. Genetic testing has presented us with many more options for determining aneuploidy, specific mutations, and whole genome testing, extending even into the fetal age range. However, the additional information gained from all this testing has revealed how little we actually know about the significance of the results and the uncertainties of what we can determine in predictive value. This has raised appropriate concern about misinterpretation and at times has led to documented fraud. Genetic sequencing is offering enormous amounts of genetic data at an enormously reduced price, which will require even greater amounts of related health information to understand its significance. The era of big data lies before us, prodded in large part by these developments. Even more dramatic is the promise of genetic editing using technologies such as CRISPR. Attempts have already been made, many say prematurely, to alter somatic and germline genes in individuals. The results are unpredictable. Hence, there is much discussion regarding what should be tried even on a research level, especially when it comes to human interventions and who should decide what should be tried. Same question applies to further attempts at embryo research with proposals to exceed the 14-day rule and recent reports of human monkey chimeras. Many are calling for global discussion but not much has been accomplished yet to make such a global engagement happen. Much of the discussion of these issues, uh, from the PCCB at least, was led by Kevin Fitzgerald until he was lured away to Creighton. Our neuroethics program has dealt with specific ethical issues, including, among others, neuroimaging, brain implants, brain computer interfaces, cognitive and moral enhancement and memory alteration. The role cognition plays in our understanding of human personhood is also explored within the realm of neuroethics. The most notorious issues addressed by Jim Giordano during this period were probably those mysterious attacks on the brains of diplomatic personnel, which came to be known as the Havana syndrome. Jim will be willing to explain all the inside information regarding this as soon as you have your top secret clearances. Even greater controversy attained to such issues as those surrounding transgender ideology. The need to be supportive and compassionate toward any patient who avowed their transgender identity should never be lost in the associated controversy. And controversies abound concerning the diagnosis and proper treatment of such individuals, particularly regarding the surgical procedures and our Catholic hospitals. The ongoing debates and social, legislative, or judicial pressures applied to individual practitioners and medical institutions should never distract us from our obligation to treat the individual with utmost respect and medical practices of proven validity. All the above issues have taken place in the context of a question, both ancient and ongoing. How do we best serve the needs and good of the patient? This is brought into the most stark contrast when addressed towards those nearing the end of life. All the end of life issues including shared decision-making, the function of surrogates, withholding and withdrawing treatments, the specter of futility, and the need for appropriate palliative care, as well as nutrition or hydration, have been a constant challenge since the advent of the new era in bioethics throughout the past decade, and certainly into the foreseeable future. 
we have continued to address these issues in our expanded ethics consultation service, as well as in lectures and published papers by myself, Claudia Sotomayor, Dan Salmacy, Alan Roberts, and Miles Sheehan. These were brought into the foreground by the latest and consuming ethical challenges presented by the COVID epidemic. There is no one in attendance who has not been affected in some fashion by the COVID-19 pandemic, and most of us in multiple ways. We have wrestled with questions regarding the just distribution of scarce resources, such as ventilators and PPE, as well as ethical issues regarding the vaccine production and distribution. The work of the PCCB during this time has largely been focused on these issues and a series of national webinars for the Catholic Health Association. What may have been less anticipated was the way that health inequities were brought to the forefront as an underlying cause for our troubled national response. Ageism, ableism, and particularly racism, forced themselves into the national consciousness in ways that I hope cannot be ignored, even when the COVID threat itself subsides. We will have to address health inequities, we will have to address the global response, and we will have to address our public health systems triggered by this pandemic. Finally, if this is the work of our recent past, how are we preparing for the future? Well, we are working to preserve the Pellegrino legacy, as well as to serve the needs of the future. We have created an interdisciplinary seminar series focusing on the work of Edmund Pellegrino. It is designed for medical and graduate nursing and philosophy students recognized as Pellegrino Scholars and included by invitation only. Outstanding student essays were collected to be presented at the annual Pellegrino Symposium. You will hear from this year's winner, Parman Tofigi, at the conclusion of today's conference. These students will soon be able to use selected clinical ethics papers from our founder that will soon be published as the Pellegrino Clinical Ethics Compendium, co-edited by Claudia Sotomayor and David Miller, as well as myself. And lastly, our crowning achievement may prove to be the newly created Masters in Clinical Bioethics which I was able to initiate with the help of Catholic University colleagues and the support of the Catholic Health Association. It will uh, offer the opportunity for mature students to earn either a certificate or a master's in Catholic clinical bioethics. We aim to produce the ethicists which will be sorely needed in the immediate future by multiple Catholic healthcare systems. And the first class will complete their studies and graduate this summer. Well, there you have it. Perhaps an apologia pro labora sua. A review of the ethical issues of the past decade and my involvement as the PCCB director. I can only hope that our work as described will not be seen to be as shallow as the description. If it's truly said that old doctors never die or retire, they just lose their patience, then this old doc must thank you all for not losing your patience with me. Everyone knows what an honor it has been to lead the Pellegrino Center through these interesting times but few can fully appreciate what a pleasure it has been for me. If the problems and challenges we dealt with 
represent the worst of times. Those that I face them with, my colleagues and friends. We few, we happy few, have surely made it the best of times as well. I thank you. I want to thank you, Dr. Donovan, for your comments. That's great. I really appreciate your leadership over the last few years, as well as your friendship to me. It's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Susan Cheng. Dr. Cheng is the Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at Georgetown Medical School, a summa cum laude graduate of UCLA, as well as attending and receiving a master's in public policy from Kennedy's Harvard School of Government, or from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. <laughs> she also has a doctorate in education leadership from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Prior to coming to Georgetown in 2015, Dr. Cheng has had a rich background in positions that fostered education, diversity, and leadership. Particularly impressive is her work with the District of Columbia Public Schools, where she focused on human capital recruitment and talent building, organizational culture building, and designing and implementing a performance management system for the central office of the public schools. As a newcomer to Georgetown myself, it's been a pleasure to meet and work with Dr. Cheng. I'm particularly grateful to her for her kindness and stepping up to assist us at this year's symposium. So please welcome her as she addresses the topic, confronting racism in American medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheehan and the Pellegrino Center for this invitation today to this very important conference. And uh, Dr. Donovan, it's been a true pleasure to honor you in your service today as well. I'm gonna go ahead and now share my screen and the PowerPoint that I have prepared for today. Great. Can you all see my screen, Confronting Racism in American Medicine? Okay, I hopefully, hopefully you can see that and you'll let me know if you cannot. Um, again, thank you for the invitation today. Today's topical overview would like to define more of race, racism and bias, uh, identify the different levels and forms of racism. I wanna introduce the concept of cumulative deprioritization and discuss its manifestations in clinical encounters as a result of bias. And then we're going to talk about the differences between being a non-racist versus anti-racist and the roles of physicians and other healthcare providers and medical institutions addressing racism and the healthcare quality that we provide. So as I begin, there uh, always start off with community agreements and just how I will manage our, my time and space in this conversation with you about race. Come with an open mind today. We'll speak from eye perspectives as we dialogue together and in the Q&A portion afterwards. Listen respectfully and we seek to understand. Go there, be as honest and real and true as possible. Be fully present right now in the moment as we dialogue about race. Ask yourself, am I trying to be right or am I trying to do better? Do not force people of color into discussions of race and subsequent discussions about race. Be humble and ready to fumble. We all make mistakes and can make mistakes in discussing issues of race. So just admit it and move on. We will respect um, and maintain confidentiality when possible. These are adapted from Ijeoma Alua's So You Want to Talk About Race, a book that we have been discussing in the GUMC um, Spaces and Places for Racial Justice and Knowledge Book Club this past year. So I wanted to begin with an inflection point. Uh, the conference is talking about um, you know, where we're at in this period of time. And I'm so grateful for the Pellegrino Center for, talk, for bringing up racial justice um, as a key inflection point right now in our country and in the world. So we are about four days away from May 25th, the one year anniversary of George Floyd's uh, murder. And on the heels of that anniversary, 
Uh, we are also meeting a, a, an anniversary of a letter that was delivered by over 500 students and alumni of the Georgetown School of Medicine to the administration on June 3rd of last year. I quote, the first line of the letter was, we are suffering from George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery to Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, and countless other senseless murders of black souls, period. We mourn alongside our fellow black students and the black community at large. We stand in solidarity with our classmates and our community against racism, and we need you to do the same. This letter to the administration talked about the need to address the suffering of our students and our alum, to talk about the anti-racism and the racial justice efforts needed to tackle the structural inequity that they have seen, not only at our med school, but in medicine writ large and healthcare. So this has been a really important inflection point. And as a result of this letter and a lot of the, the uh, work that we'll talk about today, uh, the Racial Justice Committee for Change was, was fashioned, was created to respond to our students' open letter. And you can see everything from well-being and responsiveness of students, faculty, and staff to sa safety in campus police relations, to looking at the recruitment, retention, and success of underrepresented students and faculty across the medical center and looking at racial justice in the form of curriculum and research, how we choose to teach, what we teach, and what do our students, faculty, and staff, what are we learning together as an institution? And I want to acknowledge the co-chairs that lead this, Dr. Augusti and Dr. Rett, and then our, our students, um, Jerome Murray and Stephen Kane. It was a student-led effort and has resulted in a lot of, a lot of learning um, in the last year and more to come. So with that uh, inflection point, I want to turn to uh, my first objective is defining race. What we know about race. Race is a social and political construct. It's created set of categories based on purely arbitrary physical attributes, skin color, hair, facial features. There is absolutely no biological basis for race. Studies in fact show there's a more genetic variation about 85% within any given racial ethnic group than between ethnic groups. The Human Genome Project showed us that race can be identified in our genes. Race has been employed by humans to exert privilege and power over one another for over 2000 years. Let's gonna, uh, I'd like to revisit some history here. Race is not a biological category that is politically charged. It is a political category that has been disguised as a biological one. And this is by Dorothy Roberts, the author of Fatal Invention. This became from the Racial Justice Committee for Change, a required text for students matriculating into the School of Medicine as of last year. Race as a specious classification of human beings created by Europeans, whites, which assigns human worth and social status using white as the model of humanity and the height of human achievement. 1619 slave trade. Slavery was a legal, economic, and social institution which based on and justified by the constructed belief that there were in fact biological differences between black and white people. And then furthermore, who qualifies as white, black, and Indian has actually changed over time in this country. The definitions of race are malleable, in fact. The US census racial categories have changed, again, every decade since 1790. And this gives you a sense of the categories. First one was in 1790, had four categories, free white males, free white female, other free persons and slaves. Mulatto was then a term that was adopted uh, to apply to individuals with even one drop of black blood under black race, and it disappeared in 1930s. And then at different time periods, Hispanic and Latino Latinx populations were considered white, while Irish families were not. 
So again, it's just a sense that race has actually been defined, redefined, reshaped, re reformed um, during each of these time periods. And then race and medical texts. So diseases defined in terms of racial terms that argue that people of different races are more prone to unusual disease, or maybe they experience disease differently because of their race. Hippocrates elevated hardy European races in quotes hardy and denigrated feeble Asiatic races. Benjamin Rush, black skin colors due to form of leprosy, which could be then cured and returned to normal white color, all documented in um, the medicine history. Uh, appears that ch colored children weighed considerably less than white children. Um, in fact, large cities at least is indicative of a physical degeneration which characterizes the race. That was taken from an OB textbook written by Dr. John Williams. Um, just a few examples of race in medical texts. There are a lot more. These are just a, a smattering. And then I don't want to take too much more time on this, but it's the role of medicine in exploiting race. You know, we talk a lot about now Dr. Marion J. Sims, the father of gynecology, who's a great NPR. Uh, podcast on this, believe that Black people didn't experience pain like white people did and did a lot of experimentation of enslaved African uh, American um, women um, in the name of scientific research and medical studies. In the mid-1800s, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, uh, he was a plantation physician and he claimed that Black people had lower lung capacity and that was a reason that forced labor and slavery was actually good for them. So again, almost weaponizing the biology of uh, a biological sense of race. 1960, Dr. Welch, the first dean of um, Hopkins School of Medicine and uh, pioneering eugenic scholarship here, uh, talked about controlling breeding to increase occurrence of desirable heritable, um, inherited, uh, inherited characteristics. And then lastly, the Tuskegee study, um, again, in the 1930s, this uh, based, a study based um, on the, uh, or was exploring the belief that venereal disease acted differently in Blacks, um, in Black people, and it effect, affected their cardiovascular systems because it bypassed their underdeveloped brains than whites. So again, um, all examples from our history of, uh, role of medicine exploiting uh, race. So I turn now because this might seem to you, well, that was in the past. We don't have those conceptions now. And that would be not, that would be false. <laughs> what we have here is a, a National Academy of Science paper from 2016. And it looked at two groups, white lay people and white medical students. And they asked them to take a look at the survey items on the left-hand side that you see and their degree of agreeing to the, the, fact, the, the factualness of these statements. You can take a look. And these are pretty alarming. Blacks age more slowly than whites. Whites have larger brains than blacks. Black skin is thicker than whites. Black couples are significantly more fertile. Um, these are all uh, biased impressions and erroneous impressions um, and statements about the different races and the biological differences in the races. And what they found was the substantial uh, number of, of white lay people and uh, students and residents hold these false beliefs. And not only do they hold these false beliefs, that these beliefs can actually impact perception uh, perception of pain, and subsequently and alarmingly, treatment. What treatment is is owed or given to different types of people based on biased perceptions of pain? So just as something to think about. Not just we're not relegated to history. We, this is as as um, most recent as uh, five years ago. These statements mostly agreed to. I next turn to race and its relationship to racism. So racism is a system of structuring opportunity to create those with and without advantage. 
importantly sapping the strength of the entire system of valuable human resources. So this is when we start to uh, create value and associate value, and then to make decisions that reflect that value in society based on these arbitrary characteristics that we can see, hair, face, skin, et cetera. So the consequences of this have been devastating in the field of medicine. They have led to actual exclusion of physicians based on race um, by professional medical societies and academies. The AMA allowed state and local chapters to openly practice exclusion based on race, uh, excluding membership. It led to a lot of African-American physicians not being able to join. And then the Flexner report in 1910, as a result of that report being released, 52 medical schools closed by not meeting standards. But what's also not known is five of seven historically black medical schools also closed, except for Meharry and Howard. African-Americans were excluded from medical institutions. So this impact in the field of, of closing down um, a lot of our historically black medical schools and barring entry from, from medical societies and professionals from uh, black uh, physicians. Now, what does that look like today? Uh, today in 2021 and 2020, during pandemic years, you have the American Academy of Pediatrics and the AMA issue really important apologies, public apologies, confronting their and grappling with their history and trying to figure out how do they, how do they, how do they make up for it and repair those relationships. So these are really important to note um, and they've each launched their own um, dedicated resources and how and their plans for how they will rectify the historical um, decision and the, the dis dis uh, discrimination patterns that existed in their own institutional history. So that is a, and another inflection point, looking back and taking ownership for their histories and their racist past. For you today, I'd like to define racism. Dr. Tamara Jones was the past president of the American Public Health Association. She also was a keynote speaker at GUMC a few years ago. This is her definition. Racism is a system created to separate groups of people. It's, it's not a moral uh, failing at the personal individual level. It's not a psychiatric illness. It's a system, a system of power. And it's a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value. And it do does those things, it does those things based on race. And as we have already covered, race is a social interpretation based on how we look. So again, moving beyond individual to that of a system, racism is a system. Now, there are four types of racism and we will just talk briefly about them and touch upon them. The first one is internalized racism. And that is the individual level where you start to believe privately that the biases that you hear um, about your inferiority or the inferiority of groups, you start to believe those ideas. And that is often maybe at the unconscious level that you start to internalize and believe that you are inferior, you're not as good as other people um, of a different race. On the right-hand side, there's interpersonal racism. This is at the level of um, individuals and it's biases that occur when people interact with each other in everyday interaction. A lot of the terms of microaggressions, um, statements um, that are made like, you're so articulate to an African-American student um, who's educated or um, one that I sometimes receive like, where are you really from? Those are uh, at the level of interpersonal racism. Um, assuming that you are other, that you're not part of the institution or the, this organization or this society and uh, commenting um, on an othering or a lack of value. On the left-hand bottom side is institutional racism. A lot of what the students had written in the letter addresses this at this level. It occurs in institutions, it addresses power, where it looks at the level of policy and practice uh, to see how, um, 
how outcomes inequitable as they are result and emanate from unfair policies and practices. And then structural racism, um, that's looking at bias among institutions and across society, larger society. And it's looking at the cumulative and compounding effects and their array on, uh, of impact on society, looking at everything we've sort of looked at already, history, culture, ideology, uh, interactions over time, space, and institutions. So these are the four main categories of racism as a system. All right, now I'd like to parse out the different types of racism. Active racism. So imagine that you're on this walkway. I like these little gifts. <laughs> they kind of illustrate it. So if, at the end of the day, this is your main takeaway. This can be very powerful. Racism is a moving walkway. The end point of this walkway is racial inequity and injustice. Folks who are actively racist are actively moving, uh, deciding consciously to move in the direction of racial inequity. Some people may desire this consciously and they actually expend energy to move in the same direction as that walkway. Non-racism. So you can see from the GIF right here, the person is just standing, not doing very much, not moving, but by virtue of standing and not um, uh, actively standing against as an anti-racist, they are moving along with the walkway. They do not consciously desire racial injustice and they do not seek to rush toward it, but they're being carried along the same path as actively racist people and the outcome the destination is still the same. It leads to inequity and injustice. It's a complicity by just standing there and letting things happen as the way they are without trying to interrupt the direction of the flow. That is a non-racist. And then anti-racism, as you can imagine, look at this GIF. The person's walking actively against the systems that lead to injustice, walking the opposite way it is not passive act. It instead requires constant energy, constant effort. Anti-racism works against the prevailing current progress that can seem slow or even non-existent at times. A lot of folks who adapt an anti-racist approach often comment about how exhausting it can be emotionally and tactically trying to always go against um, and try to head towards justice. It's a a, a difference here. So um, I'm rounding out this presentation and I wanted to share with you this really uh, uh, great, uh, uh, I, I guess, proposed idea from Dr. Tamora Lewis. Dr. Lewis um, shared this on our social media uh, channels and she was invited to come as a guest speaker for I2M Georgetown Medicine, uh, our annual day of reflection for students and faculty and staff at the medical school about identity and um, reflections on that. So we're gonna talk about this idea of cumulative deprioritization. This is a current theory she's working on and that it's gonna be actually published um, soon. So here are the components of this theory. There are limited resources that require constant triaging and prioritization uh, as to who is gonna get these resources. When doctors and nurses are forced to make these multiple quick prioritizations in a day, undoubtedly implicit bias and these subconscious beliefs about who matters and who is more valuable will creep into the calculus of decision-making for these limited resources. Third, this is a hard thing to know as a patient and to admit as a doctor or nurse that this is going to happen. And then here we go, defining cumulative deprioritization. Racism in medicine can manifest as cumulative deprioritization over very um, small decisions they accumulate is the whole point. They seem small, but when these small decisions add up, it can actually result in black patients receiving differential care. And now we're gonna take a look at a couple examples. 
Imagine you urgently need an open bed and there are three patients who are almost ready for discharge. Which patient gets discharged when marginally ready? So looking at beds as a limited resource. Two, imagine that there are three patients all with symptoms of PE, blood clot in the lungs, but there's only one scanner available to make the diagnosis. Who gets that scan first? How do you make that decision? And this one's really interesting. Um, imagine your nurse. One family is quiet, reserved, and rightfully distressful. They ask questions because they wanna make sure optimal care is being provided. And then one family is smiley and easy, and they also happen to look just like you. Which room do you visit more? Again, thinking through, we're all good people. We all have gone into the profession, especially the medical profession to help people. And yet here we are at this inflection point during the day when resources are limited, when time is out of essence and decisions need to be made. And subconsciously looking at these three questions, how would you decide, how would you choose how do you know that your implicit biases are not interacting and interfering to, to cover and influence how you, how you see who should get care? Who is deserving of that resource? So uh, in final, I'm gonna finalize this by talking about what does it mean to be anti-racist? It's working towards a, an active awareness of how racism affects the lived experiences of people of color. It's systemic and has been the root of a lot of our societal structures. It can be manifested both with individual attitudes and behaviors, as well as I mentioned before, the four types of racism policies and practices that govern our institutions. It can look at how white people and other privileged races can play a role in racism and understanding more your part. And then an anti-racist is an active stance. It interrupts and dismantles those behaviors, those practices and the structures that sustain racism over time. It is looking at that escalator and choosing to go against the grain and go the opposite direction actively. And it's a constant, um, constantly contributing towards designing new structures, new systems through a justice lens. So we're replacing new designs to replace the old. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, but it's this really great um, depiction of going from uh, fear and being comfortable to learning and pushing yourself to educate yourself about structural racism, to know your biases, to ask questions that you know will make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, to the larger growth zone here, um, so yield positions of power to those other, otherwise marginalized, sitting actually with your discomfort versus trying to ignore that you feel uncomfortable, um, advocating for policies that are anti-racist, um, knowing how you unknowingly benefit and your privilege and what you, what you have um, that might be as a result of the current systems in place. So again, becoming an anti-racist is not just a competency. It's a lifelong learning process and growth process where you're always continually trying to learn, develop, and grow. And then my last slide here is uh, for resources. What can we do? What can you do moving forward? Address your bias. Uh, you know, study history. I think learning your history is just so important. The history of racism in medicine and just and of racism in this country. You can evaluate provider behaviors and clinical outcomes. You can acknowledge and deconstruct your own privilege and you can call racism when you see it. And uh, finally, approach race as a social construct that it is. And uh, let other folks know that too, because this is a education process that we are undertaking. And then finally a quote by Juma Oluo, the beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism, to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only way forward.
So in conclusion, thank you again to the Pellegrino Center for this opportunity to speak to you all today. Here are some resources that I'll make sure that you get um, um, in the follow-up uh, from the conference. And again, just really some really great books we've been reading in the GUMC book club. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks so much, Dr. Chen. I really appreciate your presentation and it's both a welcome one and a challenging one uh, because it cuts to something that, you know, doctors like to think that they do wonderfully well, but they just always care perfectly for the person in front of them. Um, you know, I was struck with um, this cumulative deprioritization and we spoke a little bit about this the other day. Um, you know, Dr. Pellegrino viewed the key moral part of the clinician patient, the doctor patient relationship is to try to find the right healing action uh, that matches the good of the patient. And that that good is fourfold. The least important is the biomedical. And that's sort of what the doctor figures out can be done using the tools and knowledge that she or he has, but that that decision has to rest on how the person defines the good as an individual, as a human being in a family, in a social construct, as well as that person's own spiritual good. And I'm just struck um, that with the bias that is implicit, it can be very hard to do that. Um, very hard to recognize the good in another. Do you have any thoughts on at least how we can begin to improve in that way. Yeah, Dr. Sheen, I just really appreciate that question and been thinking about it since we've talked about it earlier. A lot of what we, uh, we, we do a lot of training and education around implicit bias at the medical center. And a lot of it is like slowing down your response rate so actually, actually, let me step back it's two things. It's one is developing your awareness that, that you have bias. And in fact, by being in a medical center or being of a, you know, researchers and folks who study the human body, it can be tempting to think, you know, every can, everything can be explained with 100% object, objectivity and not being aware of your own biases that you could be subject to those, um, could get in the way of actually of actually admitting that you maybe have bias and you are not as objective as you are. So being aware, and we often talk about the implicit association test, it's offered online, run by Harvard's Project Implicit, but it's a good way to even start to inventory what biases may, may be out there that you have around like weight bias, age bias. Um, there's even like an Asian bias out, uh, exam you could take to see like, do you associate Asianness with foreign foreignness versus um, you know being here in the United States? So again, and there's a race ethnicity one that I talked about earlier. But being aware is the first step. The second step is where I'm headed with your question, Dr. Shi, and it's pausing. It's almost like this instantaneous reaction towards these assumptions that you're making, and it happens so so quickly, so automatically in your brain. Um, and it, 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 they're, they're brought up by socialized images from the media, what you read in the newspaper, from stories you, you, you were told growing up about certain groups of people and certain things and associations um, with them. And it's pausing that quick automatic response, if you can, and trying to assess um, why it is that you're feeling a certain way, why are you being triggered and slowing down just enough to acknowledge like, okay, these resources are here. Can I take a more objective look at the file? Can I actually bring others in with me in this discussion as I make the decision of who's gonna get that bed or that x-ray or whatever resource is so limited to make that decision? So it's those two things, an awareness and then slowing down and pausing just enough to think through why are you being triggered in this way and what you might do to, to change that calculus in the moment. Thanks very much. Um, and it, it really, that particular answer you gave reflects a lot of what Dr. Pellegrino talked about really having a sensitivity to the person before you and the need to try and establish that linkage. And, you know, anytime you do it, it's work. 
And I think if I'm honest, I recognize that with some patients, it was harder work. And I wonder if part of that was a result of my own implicit biases along the way, probably. Um, from my, um, my collar world, <laughs> you know, what i am uh, been thinking of, there's a term in theology called structures of sin. And it relates to the concept that sometimes good people feel overwhelmed by systems that are so structurally in place that they seem to blot out the possibility for change, for people to flourish, for people to be able to live the life that God wanted them to have. There's a, uh, a theologian at Manhattan University, a Dr. Ahern, I can't think of his first name, and he has a book called Structures of Grace. And what he talks about are how groups of individuals working together um, intentionally can create areas where good things break out. And it seems like some of that's happening here at the medical school. Um, with the work you were talking about, can you talk a little bit about some of the things with the curriculum and racism? I know we've been on a shared committee with some of that. Yeah, so um, Dr. Sheen and I uh, are involved right now in a, a, a committee uh, looking at ways uh, we can map out thematic content, uh, threads, if you will, um, across all the different topics um, from geriatrics to, you know, um, scanning and uh, looking at um, just the way that students are taught. And one of the interesting things that has come up for me in that um, in that working group has been the idea that diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the discussions about race and racism, they're not relegated to like, okay, that's just the racism uh, topics, or that will just be the cultural competency um, portion of the topic of the day, that there actually is a move towards integration and looking at the ways in which we unpack diversity, issues of equity across all our topics that this is not relegated to the side, but that they actually bisect diversity, equity, inclusion, and these systems of these isms are addressed in each of the sort of the content areas of medicine or in research. So that's kind of a shift in thinking that you can put something to the side of DEI to the side mm -hmm. um, as its own sort of, um, you know, component. Um, to the larger question, I really credit the students uh, our medical stu school students for thinking through, um, they've demanded and they, they, they have said in order to do the mission that we are set to do at Georgetown of Cura Personalis and um, you know um, others um, in service of, of, of people and human beings, I think it's really important to note that that care, they need to be prepared, be prepared for that care. So what's happened is, um, they have asked to really go deeply on issues of um, unpacking race as a not as a biological factor. And we have found that that has been a challenge to like start to um, address those um, preconceived notions um, of, of, of uh, and unchallenged notions of race as a biological construct. Um, that is one thing. And I mentioned to you that the book by Dorothy Roberts you know, that's now a, a fatal invention is required reading now for all 200 matriculating students into the medicine uh, orientation. Um, the other things to note would be um, the introduction of courses that actually address competencies. Um, what does it take to be an anti-racist physician? Those classes have actually been added this year for all second year students before they go into their clerkships. Um, and to, to self-reflect on what that, what that means to be an anti-racist. Um, and lastly, students and faculty and staff alike have requested a need um, to, to better respond to issues of microaggressions and bias in not only the academic environment, but also the clinical environment. What do you say when a patient is microaggressing against you? Um, how do you respond to your attending and the power dynamics at play when, uh, when a physician um, says something, uh, the comments about your nationality or your sexuality and your ability to perform the work when it has nothing to do with the work. 
those are things of, that are a hot topic right now and will only increase as we move on in this particular time and period in our country. Thank you. You know, one of the other things that, aside from this being the right thing to do in the educational environment, you know, a, a big focus and one that has to remain as we look at safety and quality for the care of our patients. As we all know, a hospital can be a very dangerous place. And I'm thinking that, you know, safety and quality is one of those places that you have to completely systematize it. And this could be a place to look at <laughs> dismantling some of the aspects of structural racism, because it requires really thinking carefully about each individual. What are the symptoms they're expressing? What's going on with their vital signs? Have I listened? Have I checked? Have I rechecked? Uh, do we have systems in place to make sure that um, there are not particular problems that are happening with one group of patients as opposed to another. It's making me think about some of the bad outcomes with maternal and um, neonatal health with um, black mothers, you know, and that could we look at this as one of those ways to a structural response to perhaps some of the internalized and not planned um, racism that can be part of the structures that we have in medicine. Yes, I mean, right on, uh, uh, Dr. Sheehan. I think that it is. it has been tied of late, um, and I love the direction that you're going in, to, in terms of, ultimately, it's cast into the overall safety, safety environment. Are we doing our best if bias can mislead you to um, not prescribe right and diagnose too quickly and too early because you're relying on a shorthand, shortcuts of like, um, triage information and also just like your, your faulty biases, especially when you're tired, when you're hungry, when the biases are known to come out, when you have to make a decision pretty quickly. So it does impact down the stream um, patient safety if you are making, <laughs> letting bias come into play. For example, that pain management study that I shared earlier in 2016. And then my last comment on this, um, I love that you go there because um, of late, we've been talking in my discussions with faculty, staff across GUMC and MedStar about microaggressions and, you know, the pain of a thousand cuts. It's like not that one time someone said, you know, where are you really from? Or, you know, why did you really go into medicine? Or just any sort of topic, a uh, little comment, snide comment, or that sounds like a compliment maybe, or a joke, those, those kinds of things. I think get the thing that says, well, it's just a joke, get over it. Like you need to harden up or tough, toughen up. And the reality is if you really look at an environment of learning, we're all in, in institutes of higher ed and, and, and learning in the medical and the hospital setting, you both need challenges and you need psychological safety uh, to, to grow 